in the restaurant business, usually people are asking a lot of you. You're always going to be working holidays, long hours, dirty long hours. You're almost married to your kitchen more than you could be married to your, to your wife. Get off at night and everybody would go party until whatever time the next day and they'd sleep and wake up just in time to go back to work at 5 o'clock. The addiction becomes affecting work and so it's there for before work and even during work. There were times where I would go off camera and I would do a shot of Jägermeister because I would get so frustrated. 50 hour weeks were kind of just the minimum. What that brings is a lot of brokenness just in the sense that you're gone all the time. I can't pay my bills, I, I can't feed my child, and I work a lot, my wife hates me. There's not many options left at this point. Started moonlighting as a restaurant critic in about 2001. Started to notice how people in the industry were uh, really isolated from other folks in the community. What people would see when they'd walk in is here's a person with a job and they've got a smile, they must be fine. But the statistics that just kind of piled up behind the scenes were highest rates of drug and alcohol abuse, massive divorce rates and broken relationships, incredibly high levels of stress, very limited safety net, if any at all. All of that combined to make me think, I think I've just stumbled across the toughest industry in the country and no one's noticing. It seemed like the challenge would be, how do you meet that need in a way that has integrity for the folks in the industry? I was home alone and was awakened instantly in the middle of the night and heard a voice that said, Kevin, I need a pastor for the restaurant industry. And it was as if someone turned on a light and opened a Bible in front of me to Acts chapter 2. It says they ate together and if anyone had a need, they took care of each other. My reaction was, dang, that would work. That could really work. And so the idea was, could we build community around shared meals for folks whose business is serving others? And then could we use that as the basis for identifying needs that could be met? I've never taken my son to any sporting event, never been on vacation in the last five, six years due to the fact not making enough money and to my health. Well, I was at work and washing dishes back in the pit and my chef comes up and he goes, there's some people here to meet you. Well, I walk out and the gentleman stood up and he goes, we're from Big Table. He handed me a duffel bag, a Seahawks duffel bag. He goes, look in that pocket. I pulled out two tickets for a game on December 30th. First sporting event, my son has never been to. That was the proudest moment a father could be. I don't want to cry right now. <laughs> My teeth are just rotten. I just have horrible teeth, and being an alcoholic for 15 years certainly didn't help. I have no teeth on my top cast here. All my molars are gone. Laura sent me a text out of the blue saying that, just call Dr. Coles and set up an appointment, and she and Dr. Paxson are going to take care of my teeth. And I literally pulled off the side of the road and cried. I remember when Jill called me and I was going through a pile of bills. She paid off some of my medical bills to make life easier for me at that time and to give my daughter the Christmas that she wouldn't have had. We were expecting our baby boy. Big table got us a stroller car seat, uh, the remaining clothing and blankets that we needed. I'm actually in the process now of getting brand new teeth through Big Table. And that's just the biggest blessing that I could ever ask for because I could certainly never afford, you know, 10 grand on teeth. It was just so amazing to take my son to an event like that. Sorry. <laughs> it still brings tears to me when I, I think about it. Because that was the very first time that I realized 
the kindness of Big Table. Most of life today has been commodified. Social services or people who say they're going to care, whether that's a church or whether that's a, an agency, what they want to do is move you down the line. So it's fill out this form and then we'll say yes or we'll say no and then check a box. What we're interested in is life change for people and the way we want to do that is build an ongoing relationship with them. I think sometimes people have that social services mentality when they first engage with us, like, oh, this is just a nonprofit social service that's going to meet this immediate need. And then as the relationship begins to unfold and, then, and they realize that I'm interested in more than just their need, they're always a little like standoffish at first, but it doesn't take long in sitting down to coffee with them for them to so often just really begin to pour out their hearts about what is really going on. And that's the power of presence, just that willingness to listen and be present, and I think people need that. It's not just the donations that help you out or the dreams that they make come true. It's just a companionship, a friendship. They still call me once a month at least, either one of them kids in their jail, to see how I'm doing. To have somebody that doesn't know you tell you how loved you are and that God loves you and that you deserve to be happy and have good things happen to you. Gave me hope, gave me love, and it's when I needed it the most. They sit there and they'll call me up, let's go get a shake at Zips and let's just talk for an hour. Okay. You know, and there's sometimes I, I just needed that as a person, just to relieve some of that stress. Just really thankful. A lot of times it does seem hopeless, you know. It's just good to know that we're going to make it. I really think that we can help people feel the love of God by caring for them and noticing them. And I think that's what Jesus would do. What's been amazing to hear from people time and time again is what you did to help was wonderful. But I would trade that in an instant for the opportunity to have been in relationship with you. We live in a world today where uh, a lot of people don't feel heard and don't have close people in their lives who really will listen. And so to be present with them and offer that is a gift. If you need to talk, they're there. If you need anything, they're there. If something goes wrong and you need help with it, all you have to do is make a phone call. They're definitely a part of our whole lives now. That people actually approach me is a big thing, and that's sort of what Kevin and Jill have done. Is they've reassured me that they're my friend and they're there for me, and they care for me, and I care for them. What we get to do, which is to show up and say, here, we heard you had this need. Uh, could we help? God seems to use that in some remarkable ways. It really is this type of ministry that's happening outside of the bounds of the church walls and it is regular people who are gathering together to just be the light of Christ in places, building relationship and loving like Jesus would love. How many times people say, no one has ever treated me like this before. And we're not doing anything revolution other than just calling up and asking them how they are or offering to buy them a cup of coffee or to just say, we hear this, this need, could we help? But by the way, we're interested in you. Everyone needs to feel like there's hope. It's a shame that there's not a big table program for every behind the scenes position there is in this world, but thank God there's one for the position of working in a kitchen.